Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon on this beautiful Sunday. Yeah. Um, no, uh, terrible. Seriously, thank you so much for joining us on th uh, for this second of four church family meetings. We used to call these town halls, but uh, now we're talking about uh, church family meetings, which uh, really I think is, is a great concept uh, and a way for us to get together. And just for today, our purpose is to kind of get an update on the transition. We started that last time. Uh, we'll give you a little bit more today and just uh, some reminders and, and, and cover some of what we covered last time for those of you who are unable to make it. But then we want to turn our attention towards the future and uh, really talk about the vision that God has given us. Um, and then uh, at the end, we're going we're gonna to open it up and take some time for you to ask questions about either. Uh, ask questions about the transition, uh, ask uh, questions about our future and what we're seeing, uh, what we're um, you know, working on right now, and certainly what we're expecting to have happen in the coming days. Uh, so very much want to give you plenty of time to do that. Uh, but let's go ahead and at this time open it up in prayer and ask God to bless our time together. Okay? Uh, Father, you are just an amazing God, and we thank you so much for your church. We thank you for this church, and we thank you for the opportunity you've given all of us to serve uh, through this church. Um, we thank you for uh, the time of change and understand that that's uh, inevitable, and mostly thank you for your guidance through this time. and, and um, you're, you're giving us your, your wisdom, your insight as to where you want us to go. And we just pray, Lord, that we'll have the heart and, and uh, ears to hear uh, and the courage to move forward. Uh, we thank you for this time together this afternoon. We ask that you bless it. We ask that you bless Brian and Jeff as they uh, talk through uh, our future. And uh, we ask that you uh, just give us the uh, spirit to ask the questions that are important um, and just help uh, get everyone on the same page as we move forward. Thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, uh, just before we begin, can we, is it need to be this dark in here? Can we bring lights up a little bit? I like to see people. I know you're out there. Is it possible? Fellas, is anybody out there? Let there be light. All right. I mean, in the room. Are the cans all the way up? Yes. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, for, first of all, for taking time to come out. I know it's lunchtime, and usually um, you're on your way home for lunch, and I was joking with somebody that, I, that I'm about 45 minutes from falling asleep. So <laughs> the, the, the old, I, I'm like a, on Sunday afternoons, I'm kind of like an alligator. If, you, if, I, if, my, if my feet get as high as my head, I just fall asleep. It's, it's like an automatic thing. <clears throat> no, I'll be awake the whole time. But most of you know by now the basic plan that we're calling the transition plan. Uh, I sent a letter out, or we sent a letter out, last August to the, to the whole church family. Uh, and then I shared just a bit at the annual meeting for those of you who were there. We shared much more in detail about a month ago at the East Campus at our first church uh, family meeting. And we took video of that, uh, by the way, and the highlights of that are on our website. So if you weren't able to be at that meeting, you can go to the website and you can watch and listen as we talk through much more detail about the transition benefit. I want to review just a couple of aspects of that to, to, to remind you, or maybe some of you uh, have, just to bring you up to speed, and then I'll move on to talking about vision in the future. But at FBCG, uh, we have become increasingly aware over the last decade or so that uh, succession planning is extremely important to the health of any organization, and in particular, um, to the long-term health of the church. So our senior management team, and that group we call senior management team is myself, Jeff, Pastor Bruce McAvoy, and Doug Kite, our director of operations. Uh, we have been talking about and working on succession planning throughout our ministry departments, and including um, my position as senior pastor. Um, I have come to believe during that process, we've been talking about succession planning for about five years now, which probably got me started thinking about it, but I've come to believe that God has prepared uh, both me and FBCG for a healthy transition uh, in leadership. I've been he around here long enough, and some of you have been around here long enough as well, to see transitions like this done uh, poorly, and you've been around long enough to see them done well. And we, I believe, have an extraordinary opportunity to do things extraordinarily well right at this point in time. Uh, the transition in me began uh, several years ago um, as I just began this sort of the sense and feel the sense and along with my wife that um, God was leading us into sort of, sort of a new season and it kind of began personally like 
uh, this summer, and I began, this started a couple of years ago, so I was looking ahead as we're planning uh, our, for our family life, and in one, this coming summer, summer of 2016, I realized that three things would happen that created a sense of season change. One was, I would turn 60 years old in August. I know I look much younger than that, but I'll, I'll turn 60 years old in August. Um, that I, this will be our 30th year, Lorena and I, my 30th year at the church in ministry, and our youngest son would head off to college. All those were happening right about at the same time. That, be, that began this season of change. Um, and seasons of change are good, and they have, they're, they're filled with all sorts of feelings. And stuff. Did that go off all of a sudden? Yeah, it did. That's what Brian meant to say I was... I didn't realize the seasons of change that fast. Okay. Is it on? Am I on now? Oh, yeah. there we go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so all those things were happening, and that, that, that started me to think about season change. Uh, at the same time, Jeff was going through some, some opportunities and things he was thinking through. So all that came together, and I started sharing my thoughts with the executive council a couple of years ago. I think we're heading into a season. I think this is what, I'm, uh, this is what I think God wants for me, but I need confirmation. I need to, 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 you to help me with this. And so they began to work on me with that. And so the uh, Executive Council and the SMT have used all this time the last couple of years to prepare for this transition and put together a plan. At the same time, I became convinced uh, through our relationship, through the working together with Jeff over the last 16, almost 17 years now on our staff and the last eight years preaching together and planning worship and so forth, that, that God was preparing Jeff uh, for the role of lead pastor somewhere. If not here, then somewhere else, and that went into my thinking as well. And so uh, we, when I say we, I, th I say myself, the executive council, the SMT believe Jeff is qualified and gifted and called to serve as our next senior pastor here at the church. The plan is for me to remain. Uh, I, you know, I keep hearing people say things like, like at, the, at one of our Holy Week community services, we're standing out in the lobby and people are streaming in and we're, Jeff and I are greeting people at the front. It's really a fun time in our church life, but <laughs> one of my friends from the church said, hey, you're really good at this. You'd be a great Walmart greeter someday. <laughs> that's really what he said. I'm like, well, yeah, it's not that's not happening soon, I just so you know. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I'm not retiring. I'm not uh, going away. Uh, I'm going to remain as a full-time pastor here for at least five more years, and we'll see after that. But my role will, will shift from being the senior leader of all of our staff and all of our departments to a different role. Uh, my role will be on, in preaching. I'll preach just as often as I have the last uh, eight years or so. Um, I'll, I'll focus more on leadership development, develop, uh, mentoring our younger staff, our other pastors, and an organizational development that is preparing FPCG for its future. And I'll be involved in a few other things like this fall, I'm going to China to be a part, uh, to share with one of our Serve the World partners. I love doing that sort of thing. So I'll be, but I'll be full time, not going anywhere. So I've said, uh, we've said that publicly, folks who aren't really paying close attention may not notice any change at all for a while. They may go, well, I thought something was going to change. Because up front, it'll feel a lot the same. Now, be, uh, behind the scenes with staff and in leadership meetings, there'll be, there'll be meetings I'm not in anymore. And Jeff will lead those. Uh, uh, and some of those things will change, but it won't be dramatic, which is why we, have, which why we want to pursue this kind of transition, because it reduces trauma on the life of a whole church family. Uh, the, the transition agreement that we have come up with uh, says that the transition will formally happen on September 1st, this coming fall. Uh, so that's when the baton gets half to, passed uh, along formally, uh, handed off formally, pending approval by the FPCG membership and a vote in August. That's very important because our membership still has to vote on these kinds of issues. <clears throat> but pending that vote, the transition happens in September. But you need to know that behind the scenes, We've been moving things along, preparing for them, because you can't just make a transition like that in one day. We've been preparing for the last year, moving things around, preparing uh, for this process in some way, and then it will continue for another year or so after that as we get everybody used to the transition. So that's uh, the, the transition plan. Uh, I, I went over it quickly. There's more information available on the website. If you have questions about that, Hold them and ask them at the end when we come up with the all-question time at the end of today's meeting, okay? I want to transition now into talking about uh, vision because uh, actually from my position, <clears throat> the vision for our church and the direction of our church overall is actually more important than the transition planning mm -hmm. because vision is what, um, is what God calls us to collectively, whoever is sitting in this chair or that chair. Uh, let me go back and review a little bit about how we as a church became a two-campus church in the first place. Some of you have been around FPCG since we were one campus just 
at South Street. Uh, some of you have only been around since we've been to campus. You only know us as West and East Campus. Let me review that process a little bit. I became senior pastor in 1994, and through the, the, from there to the end of that decade, the late 90s, FBCG went through dramatic growth. I mean, d- double-digit growth for several years in succession, 12% growth, 14% growth. Um, and the East Campus uh, grew from one service to two services to three services, and then we added the Saturday night service, and we had nowhere to go. So and we, the, and we, wanted to, we, wanted to, we started asking, what do we do next? What, what's, we exhausted all the options right there at that site, buying homes, building on the parking lot, tearing the roof off. We looked at all kinds of things, uh, and nothing really worked. So we started looking for property. And we eventually, after uh, some difficult decisions, difficult moments of disagreement and so forth, we located this property. And it was much more money than we thought we'd have to expend. But we, we got the property. We spent several years paying it off. And in 2004, built phase one of this campus, fully expecting in a few years to build the rest of it, which was we were going to move everything out here, including a 2,000-seat worship center right out there, uh, a, a massive uh, complex. Uh, then 2008 happened. Well, we, we, we went into two campuses. This campus grew very rapidly. We tipped very quickly, one-third, two-thirds. As a church family, we took us all by surprise. We weren't even sure people would worship in this room, and it filled up very quickly. We had two services and so forth. And then 2008 came, and it was right about the time we were uh, looking into the plan, when are we going to start the next phase, build the sanctuary, and the, the economy went south. We put everything on hold and uh, began to reassess everything. And it was during that next couple of years we became convinced that um, by looking around the landscape of North American churches and by looking at our church, we became convinced that God wanted us to stay two campuses for the foreseeable future, not to build a big giant campus out here, not to spend that money, but to figure out how to do this. At the same time, the multi-site movement around America was happening. People were going to multiple sites, and we learned how to do two-site ministry here at FBCG. That's how we got to be two campuses, and that's how we are today. Then uh, a few years ago, about uh, 2012 or so, we began talking about what else we needed here at this campus and at the East Campus because we knew the East Campus, the lower level especially, needed a lot of work, way out of date, um, and we needed to, to invest some there. This, we were still experiencing growth at this campus. We needed to do some things here to allow for that growth to happen, especially in our midweek ministries. And so we, that's how we put together the, 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 the expansion project that we called Growing to Serve. We initiated that. It included paying off our debt, which at that time was like $800,000, which we paid that off. We renovated the East Campus <clears throat> completely. Uh, the East Campus is beautiful now. Both levels are, are extraordinary. And we added space to the north edge of this building, and we left off a section that we were hoping to do. Had we raised enough money, the, the lobby was going to extend out that way. You still see the lines painted on the sidewalk out there that we would like to do eventually including a remodel of a big venue out in the lobby space out there. So that's, that's what we did, and, but we only did part of that project, and we're within now shouting distance of finishing paying off this project. Uh, as you all are faithful, and as our church family is faithful, we, we are on schedule to finish uh, paying that off at the end of this year and be debt-free again, which meant it was time last summer to start look, getting out the plans again because we try to stay way ahead of it, let's look at it, let's look at growing to serve. Is what we originally designed the right thing? Should we keep going that direction, or do we need to readjust? One of the things we've inherited here as leaders over the last couple of decades is we always evaluate. We, we, we don't just assume we're going to do the next thing. We reevaluate economically, fisc- fiscally, um, where our congregation is, change, pace of change, all that stuff. So we, we got up, started to get out the plans to reevaluate is what we had on the drawing board the right thing for us at this time? Should we build that site out? Should we do the things we're planning on doing? And right about that same time, we were getting out those plans to look at them. Uh, We were approached by another church in our region about the possibility of what they were calling a merger. Uh, And and I'll I'll, I'll stop there and let Jeff take over and tell you about that. Uh, that was, this is last summer now, and how that went and how that got us into thinking about uh, this next season of our vision for FBCG. Thanks, Brian. I always feel funny when Brian's talking, I'm just sitting here. I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, <laughs> yes, what he said, yeah. So anyway, yes to all of that. Um, as Brian mentioned, uh, we were approached by a church, and some of you may know about this church. We're not going to talk uh, publicly on, about the name of the church and where it is, just because things are in discussion, and we don't, but some of you may know about this. 
Anyway, it's a smaller church, and they were coming to what they perceived to be the end of their life cycle. Financially, critical mass, ability to sustain ministry, they were just felt like they were going to have to shut their doors. And we're looking for, um, actually, they were approached by a different church about that, about a multi-site thing, and they didn't go that route, and they approached us. And at first, my first reaction, just personally, was, why? I don't see that. We already have two campuses. It seemed kind of close. I wasn't sure. I just didn't have a vision for that. And I think Bruce and Brian and Doug and those of us that knew about it all felt essentially the same way. Intriguing, flattering they'd consider us, but I didn't really see it. So we said, we said sort of a soft no, no thank you. Uh, on, a, um, on a retreat for our senior management team, Brian and I and Bruce and Doug, in Lake Geneva, we sort of revisited that question, and independently we all shared that, and I felt this way, there was something gnawing at me. I couldn't let that go. Like, wh- is that something we should pay attention to? As Brian said, one of the things I've come to love about our church, and not just our leadership, but our church as a whole, is that we're willing to readjust where God leads. It's very unusual in a church 120 plus years old to, to re- readjust and realign with the vision as God directs us. And so I just felt in my spirit, like maybe there's something there we don't yet see. Shared that, and everybody felt the same way. Uh, was that fair to say? We all felt the same way, like maybe we should revisit this. Didn't know what that meant. Didn't have a vision for like taking it over. We didn't know what we were thinking. Could it be another site for a resource center? Could it be a, a food pantry, a ministry center? We just didn't know. But we did all feel like we should perhaps not be so quick to close the door. Um, to help us along that line, we brought in a consultant by the name of Jim Tomberlin, who's uh, arguably the national expert in multi-site, multi-site movement among churches. Been a pastor, experienced it in different churches, travels around the country now, helping churches do this effectively. And he came in and did a, a weekend visit for us, all of our services, and visit with our staff, and said some several things to us that kind of woke us up uh, to this possibility. And, and by, by the way, what I'm about to share is not specifically related to that church, but to the idea of multiple campuses for us. The most significant thing at first for me was after that, those meetings, we went out to dinner. I think I shared this at the last meeting. I don't recall exactly. But we went out to dinner uh, after the Saturday night service, and it was you and I and Doug and, and, and Jim Tomberlin. And he said, maybe you should think of yourselves as a neighborhood church, like the old parish model. When he said the phrase neighborhood church, something in my mind and heart clicked. I went, I like that. What, that so it just struck me. Um, I even texted Brian on the way home. We both shared that. We both had a, a similar response to that. Talked about it with our senior management team. Similar, favorable response. Something about that idea. Talked to our staff about it. Our executive council about it. Same idea. That there was all, people were, were, were moved by that. Yes. Now, what I, this is still taking shape. So we're sharing with you the sort of the embry, embryo of a vision, if you will. What I mean, what we think we mean by that is not multi-site where we're trying to put a video venue in every city in the Chicagoland area but a strategic gospel-centered effort to reach our region where God's placed us, our neighborhoods. People live in neighborhoods. And one of the things that, struck that, that was said to us, to me, by Jim Tomlin, that struck with me is, do we really expect more and more people to drive from farther and farther away to a bigger and bigger box here? Is that w- what we expect? And I, he, one of the things he said is, the massive megachurches in the country, huge, enormous worship centers, those will be increasingly difficult to fill and maintain and fund in the future. In a way, I think God has protected us and preserved us from being um, strapped with that massive thing where the tail kind of wags the dog. So the question for us is not, not, could we do it? We probably could. But should we and why? And what I'm coming to see and feel, uh, and I think we are as well together, is that it's a strategic answer to the question why for the most effective gospel impact in our region. People live in neighborhoods. You drive through neighborhoods to get here. You pass by other people uh, to to drive to this church. Why? What if we began to think about multiplying who we are in different neighborhoods around the Fox Valley? Over time. I'm talking just down the road, right? If you ask the average person if they like, uh, if they would prefer a church of 250 or 2,000, what do you think most people would say? 250. Feels better. But if you ask them what they would prefer from their church, they start talking about things that only a 2,000-person church can provide. In the neighborhood model, perhaps there's a way to do both. 
have the energy and synergy and resources and vitality of a large church with the, with the intimacy and community feel of a neighborhood church. So again, we do not know if the, if the discussions will progress with this particular church, what that will mean, or even if that's going to happen. But I do feel like God has used that, this process um, to help us answer that question. What's, what is it going to look like if we're going to expand our gospel impact? A bigger and bigger box here and at the East Campus? Or multiplying ourselves? And one of the things, um, I'm, uh, I'm not sure, are we coming back around to me or should I just say it all now? Say it all now. All right, good, here we go. <laughs> one of the things that the, the consultant also shared with us was this. You don't have to be, because one of the questions I had was, well, we're not full. It's not like there's no seats left. I mean, we're, we're comfortably full, but there's still room. Why would we do this? He says, actually, you don't need to be full to multi-site well. You need to be healthy. He says, you'd be surprised how many unhealthy churches are trying to do this. And then he said, or we didn't say, but he implied, and I've, we talked about this, was we almost have not just an opportunity, but a responsibility um, to reproduce who we are in a healthy way in other places. Uh, because, you know, 80% of our people drive from 15 minutes or in inside of that. What about those that live outside that? What about those that we expand our reach to, into different neighborhoods? Uh, it, it, it's been, it, it, it has, sometimes you get ideas and then, for me, they kind of wane over time, you know? Eh, I don't know if that was a good one. Uh, this hasn't. We feel like God is, is sort of galvanizing us around this. And I do not know yet, we, nor do we know what that will mean or when that will happen, but we think it's a good and the right time to talk about, we think this is where God is aiming us as a church. And we're willing to walk that path. Just as we never intended to be two campuses here. But we are. And God's done amazing things through that. I think perhaps this is another redirection for us as a church family. Um, so I, we'll pass it off. I'll yeah. just say yes to what you say and then jump in later. <laughs> and just keep storing up your questions if you have them. <clears throat> now back to uh, what I said when I was talking about before um, Jeff explained that process to you. We were reviewing Growing to Serve mm -hmm. because originally we did plan on adding a lobby space there, some office space here. Um, uh, and so we, we still, we, we, keep, we keep looking at that. Uh, and as we do, what, I want, what, I, what we want to let you know is that looking forward, um, what it means is we anticipate that this could mean we're moving in two directions at once mm -hmm. over the near-term future. Uh, meaning we are going to evaluate those plans for this West Campus. There are still a couple of things we would like to get at in this physical plant, this facility right here. Uh, for example, um, we have uh, some nursery space issues. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily always on Sunday mornings, but uh, midweek with our women's ministry, which is, which is an area of ministry that's growing, and it's one of our major outreach engines. And they have, we have had midweek problems. We've had to uh, borrow other space to put uh, babies in because our nurseries aren't large enough. So we have some nursery space issues here that we need to take care of. Because if you don't have room, adequate, attractive, safe room for people's children, you don't have room for them. And that's one of the first decisions people make. So we need to address that. We also would like to address this room a bit. This room was not intended to be a full-time forever worship center. It's a multi-purpose <laughs> room. And as we look ahead, if we're not going to build a big worship center out there, we would like to see this room become more, uh, more able to facilitate powerful worship experiences than it is right now. So we have some issues to address in this room, and we have uh, a question to answer about Shepherd's Heart Care Center. Our Shepherd's Heart ministry is, is growing dramatically. That's uh, the ministry that we used to call our food pantry. Now it's Shepherd's Heart Care Center. It involves a lot more than just Mm -hmm. food is at the east campus lower level it's doubled and even tripled in size over the last few years and god is trying to do something unique there and so we're asking ourselves what's the next step for shepherd's heart uh do we do we create new space out here for a freestanding other facility do we liberate office space and bring it over here so we can turn the entire lower lower level over there into shepherd's heart and let it grow we don't know those are all questions we're asking so we are anticipating that when we come back to you maybe this august in the annual meeting, maybe some other time, with here's our next Growing to Serve ministry expansion project. It won't look like what we thought we were going to tell you two years ago. It won't just look like here. It's going to look two-pronged. It's going to say, we're going to do this at the West Campus at this amount for this reason, and we're going to do this preparing for our third campus or have the third campus in sight or 
to re rehab something or whatever, or we're going to be preparing for that. Does that make sense? We're going to likely be looking at two directions at once. Now, like Jeff said, we don't, we're not far enough down the road with the third campus idea yet to even know where it's going to be or what it's going to be. We just feel this really strong pull mm -hmm. over the last eight or nine months to be paying attention, that God's trying to do something. And he's got our attention, and it's time for us to let you know about that he's got our attention and what that might look like going forward. So, uh, oh, I was going to add, incidentally, along that lines, another church uh, also approached us from further away, uh, still in the Chicago land area, but a little further away about the same thing. Would you take us over inside our denomination? And we felt like that was just too far away, and we were already wondering about this one, so we said no to that. But it, what it did is, it, I, I didn't even realize this was going on. What it did is affirm to us that there's something happening here among God's people in this place that's a good thing that God's doing, and people see that, and churches that, are, that want to see ministry continue where they are, it's not unusual. It's going to be increasingly common for them to approach churches like ours to say, can you help us? Would you take us over? Is there a, a merger that could happen here? So anyway, there's been some other affirmations along the way just to throw that yeah, in. Yeah, one of the things that we learned, and many of you may know about this because you read or you see it online or whatever, but <clears throat> something like 70% of all churches in America are in plateau or decline. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of small churches who, that are just dying. Uh, mainline churches, churches even in our denomination that are dying. And they face terrible choices, meaning w our church is going to either become a restaurant or it's gonna, we're going we're gonna to give, give to someone who can, who can keep ministry going here after however many years. And my brother's church has taken over another property. We, we hear it all the time. And um, the advantage of it is sometimes these properties are just given to you. Uh, sometimes there's some work to be done on them. You have to invest in them. Um, but it, it, it's a way of multiplying and growing at a, at a, at a co in a cost-efficient way, much less expensive than building a, more gi a giant thing here. And it puts you closer to neighborhoods. And it even makes your organization, if you think just in a business model, church isn't a business, but it behaves in some ways like a business. In a business model, it makes you less vulnerable to one of your sites going bad. For example, if we, if we had someday four campuses and one of them really struggled for whatever reason, you can just cut it and sell it. You don't have to maintain the giant mothership somewhere and go into debt to do so. So there's yeah, a lot of reasons. That's not going to happen. We're going to reach people. <laughs> yeah. <and laughs> but um, but saying, for, so for, for just fiscally and, and organizationally, it can be a wise thing to do. Now, every single one has to be carefully considered. But the point is that, and what Jim Tomberlin told us is, uh, that the, the reality is so many churches every year just go out of business in America and just completely cease to exist. They close. And healthy churches, strong churches that are gospel-centered uh, have a responsibility and an opportunity here and there to, to infuse new life into those places that exist rather than them becoming restaurants or, or, um, or just raised uh, and can keep gospel ministry in communities and uh, that's what we're intrigued about. So anyway, that's, we, that's as much as we wanted to share with you verbally and let you just kind of mull over it and, and then fire off questions. I'm sure you've got a thousand questions. Ask questions. We'll see, do as much as we can. Yeah, and we do have, yeah. since it's a large room, there are a lot, and by, by the way, let me just say, thank you so much for showing up. This is a great turnout. It really encourages me. In my experience, often on town hall meetings, it, turnouts aren't that great. And usually people show up because they're excited or they're nervous. Maybe a little bit of both here today. <laughs> so I'm just grateful you showed up. And if you do have a question, raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you. So we, as you're thinking about those questions, and we, we absolutely want you to, need you to ask some of those questions, I'm going to take a minute to give you a little bit of the EC perspective on this, the Executive Council. You know, in our role as the board to provide oversight, we, we sort of have a two-pronged uh, role here around balancing trying to get things out of the way so that they can move forward quickly and stopping them from moving forward too quickly. <laughs> um, and I have to tell you, when, when we were first introduced to this idea, you know, I expected a lot, of, uh, a lot of trepidation, a lot of concern, a lot of questions, a lot of uh, issues. Um, and certainly we have questions, we have a lot of things that we still have to uncover, figure out, etc. But what I, I can tell you that the EC saw from the very beginning is what I hope you just saw in the two of them, and that was vision. Um, you, you hear them talking, you see the excitement, Jeff trying to stay in his chair. Um, you know, we, we felt that, we saw that, and I have to tell you, the, the immediacy around coalescing, around a vision 
uh, was unanimous. It was exciting. It was something that I, being in church governance here for many, many years, hadn't seen in a long time. I, mean, I think we've done wonderful things, as we've talked about already, our ability to course correct, your ability to be flexible, kind of move where God's uh, directing us, has been, I believe, a, a true testament to the faith and, and the uh, willingness to be guided uh, as a congregation. It's been fabulous. But when we heard this, I mean, the excitement was palpable. I, we, 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 I haven't felt this way in a while, and I, I think if you talk to any of the EC members, they would tell you that there was just immediate excitement. Not because of the churches that approached us. That's not, that doesn't matter. It, it was the vision that I believe that, that is God, has, God has given these gentlemen, and I believe is translating uh, for us as well. So, um, can, can I just throw in something in there, Ken, on that? The vision really... I don't want this to sound like we have a whole new vision, we're doing something different as a church. Our mission is not changing. It's to see lives transformed with the gospel and make an impact in the world. That's the mission. We talk about Reach, Connect, Equip, serve as a way of doing that. Reaching people with the gospel, connecting them to each other and to Christ, equipping them with the word, and setting them loose, unleashing them in the world to serve. That's strategy and mission, right? What that's going to look like is God's bringing into focus. So I don't want you to leave here thinking, oh, it's a new vision, it's all changing. It's not. We're doing the same thing. But we think God, to be most effective in that, it's going to mean this. Does that hope that's helpful? No, I think it's very helpful. Again, he's, he's really excited about it. Yeah. All right. Let's take some questions. Adrian, back there too. Adrian. Yeah. When we, uh, before we started in this second uh, site here, at the West Campus, we were growing so rapidly at the East Campus that we started Bellybrook Baptist Church with Brian Smith. And we asked several members of the congregation to commit to go there for a period of time to help that get launched. And we did that because we didn't have room there and it was gonna take a while for this to be able to get developed. Is that something that's also in a future plan is to grow in some of these neighborhoods by doing something similar to that? Great, great question. So um, church planting and multi-siding are similar but different things. And you're right, we planted a church. Um, If I don't quite get the question, I'll give several parts to it, I'll I'll try. Um, National surveys show that 60% of church plants fail within the first three years. Just don't, they don't make it. Over 80% of multi-sites succeed, thrive. Now, there are lots of different ways to do multi-site. Most of us think about like what we think of Harvest or Willow, where there's a big video screen and you just kind of plug and play. That's not what we're talking about, to be clear. We would see predominantly live preaching with leadership raised up in that neighborhood. Uh, So what makes a church multi-site is not whether or not there's a video venue, but how, if it's centrally governed, reproducing our DNA and having a central kind of governance and connection to the mission and vision and values. So when we say multi-site, that's what we mean. It's kind of a... To your point, Glenn, it's kind of a hybrid between the old church plant model and the, um, and the other extreme of, of, of uh, campuses. Does that make sense? Um, some churches that have multi-sided for 10 years are now, now just beginning to cut those churches loose. Part of the reason church plants don't make it is they cut the umbilical cord too soon. Mm-hmm. The DNA isn't transferred enough, the strength isn't there, they aren't given enough resources to thrive, and they are cut loose too soon, they can't make it. Perhaps, we don't know what God will do, but perhaps this would be a pattern to five, six, seven years down the road, have independent churches that are thriving. We want to hold that loosely. But I do think the multi-site neighborhood idea is a way of ensuring that there's really thriving gospel ministry in these locations before you just cut it loose to sink or swim. Is that, is that get at your question? Yeah. Okay. Adrian? Thank you. As we consider... Um, expanding our our influence outside of the city limits of Geneva and and also understanding that our culture has a pretty bad stereotype of the word Baptist (laughs) are are we are we also considering a name change Adrian is not a plant (laughs) (laughs) I was gonna say the same thing yeah thank you you got it just you asked the question exactly like I asked you that (laughs) yeah no that's not true don't say Uh, something I'm just someone's walking out of your mind (laughs) That's a great question, and, uh, and I, think, I think, yes, we would, we would say we're open to that. Um, I like the phrase neighborhood church. Envision neighborhood church at Peck Farms, neighborhood church at, you know, Pepper Valley, neighborhood church at wherever. So we don't have plans. We're not rolling out a new name or anything, but I think if, if God did this, and again, we're holding this loosely. We don't know when or, or if this will happen, 
But if, if God did this, it would be the natural right time to make such a change. Let me just talk a little bit about that. Those of us who have been around leadership here for a long time, I mean, I've heard, I've heard uh, uh, the notion of changing our name f for uh, all my 30 years here. It happened, somebody brought it up at almost one of the first meetings I was in. Uh, and in our denomination, the Baptist General Conference, we've seen um, there, there, there have only been a handful of churches, maybe there's been 250 churches started in the last 15 years or so, brand new churches, and not a single one of them has Baptist in the name except for inner city churches. And the reason for that is Baptist is misunderstood. Not Baptist is bad, it's misunderstood by our culture. Um, the other thing is that our denomination actually changed its name. Our whole denomination is now called Converge Worldwide because they realize Baptist doesn't, uh, doesn't relate very well all over the world. So our whole denomination changed its name for the very same reason. So we know that it's a barrier. In fact, our name, First Baptist Church of Geneva, has three words in it that are barriers for people who live in our region that we're trying to reach. First, because that comes out of a very old tradition where the first church in the town was the, was the, uh, was the Anglo-Caucasian church. Second church was the minority church. Um, Baptist tells people, if you're not Baptist, you can't come, or they misunderstand Baptist. In Geneva, if you grew up Catholic, you're told there are, diet, there are certain uh, parishes. parishes that you're not allowed to go outside that parish. I've had people ask, say to me, you know, I don't live in Geneva, am I allowed to come to your church? That's their background. So uh, we've joked that almost any name, for our, for our missional purposes, almost any name is better than our name. If you think in terms of the barriers. Now, I, I love being Baptist. I love everything about being Baptist. I think our tradition, if you go back 500 years, that's who I want to identify with. Uh, but how people understand Baptist is, diff is different. And if that's a barrier to them hearing the gospel, I think we consider removing it. But that, that's, a, that's something God will do in us at the right time in the right way. And I also, the neighborhood Lots church... Lots more thing, church family meetings. Yeah. <laughs> but neighborhood <laughs> yeah. church, there's no barriers there. It sounds kind of like us and it, it removes some of the things that people misunderstand, and we can stay as Baptist as we want to be within that. So. It's, very yeah, so important, I, it's very important to reiterate, I, we love this church. I'm not ashamed at all of who we are, and I'm not embarrassed personally about the name, but I have seen in 17 years almost of being here that it has been a barrier to people. I used to lead every one of the new members' classes. That always came up. Well, I didn't know what you Baptists do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> do you eat your young? How does it go? I don't want to be a part of it. But they, yes, they were, yes. they're nervous about it, so... But, you know, it just, just to make sure people understand, th this is something we understand. There's a certain level of sensitivity around yeah. that, and, and we're going to be very careful to talk through that, process through that. Um, you know, we're not going to change the name to change the name. If, if the vision and, and the direction, the mission, and how we accomplish that mm -hmm. drives us to that natural decision, then that's the decision we need to make to accomplish the vision that God's laid out for us. I do want, though, Brian, if you would respond real quickly, just to make sure people really hear this. The, the difference between a name and how we act as a church, how we act as a church doesn't change. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's probably the most important thing. Um, like I said, the, the, the Baptist tradition, if you study it, is, is, is a beautiful one. Uh, ba Baptists, going way back, are people who, who were absolutely committed to the, tr to the truth of God's word. And when I wanted to be able to preach and teach and practice God's word as they saw fit without an authority, in the state or the pope or somebody else telling us how to interpret it and how to live it out. That's our tradition. People died for that tradition in Europe 500 years ago and they came to this country. Our predecessors in this church came here for that religious freedom. We will never disrespect that aspect of our heritage. The question is, in our culture today, do people understand who we are before they're in among us? And my, I think that's the question we want to answer. If, if that, I, that I had a friend clear. of mine who said, uh, he's a Baptist, Southern Baptist Church, and he said in people outside of his region think of Baptists as potlucks and protests. <laughs> he said that's the way they think of it. I like potlucks. Part of that's good. Did you, <laughs> Not so much protests. Uh, do we have a uh, mic over here, please? Oh, you know what, just use mine. Hi, okay, so what is the, the church plant, like what is their population like? Is it all like old people or, and that's why it's dying or is there families or that type of a thing? talking about the church. Define the old. <laughs> you don't need say, to be asking that. I, I need to be asking that. I would say not bearing that. children anymore. Yeah. yeah. Type yeah. Of a You're talking about the church that approached us? Yeah. Go, yes. ahead, go ahead, Jeff. No. Yes. Um, it's predominantly an, an older congregation um, and uh, the way, their own words for it are this. 
they're, um, they are so busy just servicing the, the few that are there and, and, and trying to keep the doors open, they can no longer do any ministry. And young families, younger people just aren't, they just doesn't feel, it's not attractive. Okay, so then I have another question. So what part of our, is there any percentage of our congregation that currently lives in that area? For example, okay, that, that's, a great, that's the yes. great next question. You're thinking right alongside with, with us. Our thinking right now, and we've actually visited, um, Jeff and I flew over to Ohio to visit with my brother's church leadership. They have four different sites along to, with their main one. And they've done it all sorts of ways. They, they, a church was deeded to them. They, then they bought property and built another one. They took over, a, they're looking to take over a theater. They'll, they've done it several ways. We went up to Minneapolis a couple weeks ago, visited with a church up there. We're trying to learn as much as we can from people who've done this. Our thinking is w whatever facility, the hardest thing to find is the right place for a next campus. That, that's the biggest decision, where it is and, and whether there's a, a neighborhood there that can be reached. And we would make the decision based on where it is, what it would cost us to get it, if anything, what it would cost to make that site viable, where it is, how many of our people right now come from that neighborhood, and how many of them would be willing to go there and reach their neighbors. Now, uh, it's possible that some people from the neighborhood would rather just stay here because they're not terribly um, uh, entrepreneurial or evangelistic or they don't, they don't see that as a calling. That's fine. But we would look for people who, for whom they go, who are excited. Yeah, that, I live there. That'd be a great place. I could take people right down the street. Mm -hmm. And so we would, and in, in this particular neighborhood, we have tons of people who live there. Um, so our question would be, does all that synergy come together to make sense? for us, because the neighborhood model, we're not, we, won't, we don't want to go 40 miles from here and put a video venue in. We want to be related. Yep. Oh, my question follows up exactly on that, but um, in the spirit of sharing our, D sharing our DNA, um, do we have, and we have we looked at or felt led to the staff that would uh, further carry our DNA? That have we onboarded for, uh, people at this point Great. within this culture, within this dynamic? Because as a member for many years, and bringing children in, and throughout almost 20 years, I've brought 18 and, again, two-year-olds. So I see the same faces in the nursery, in the senior, sta uh, senior children's staff, and that stability has been critical. Mm -hmm. And you talk about sharing that DNA, and it's not just room in the nursery. It's faces. It's mm -hmm. con consistency. It's people that we feel good about. And, and, and God leads those people. Are we seeing those people to bring on? That, that, first of all, I think you're very insightful in your, your comment that it's not just space, it's people that create the DNA. It's, of course it's, it's people. Um, to your question about do we have a team assembled, no, not yet. But we would, I, I am of the opinion, this is not something you hire outside for. This is, if you want to reproduce who you are, it should be who you are. And so we are in the process right now of thinking about, well, who would that be? What would that look like? You know, and, and again, I don't, I don't, it's important we don't get hung up on this particular church and this particular this, this may not happen, this one that's approached us, but it has caused us to ask these questions and say, we think this is where God is directing us. And yes, we are in the process of not only identifying, but laying out paths for other people in our church to move into positions of leadership. One of the things that multi-siding can do is create opportunities for young leaders and, and leaders inside the body already to have, up, up, they would have, up, otherwise have opportunities to grow their leadership. So, so carrying that a little bit forward, first off, love the passion, because that's exactly what I think we, we need to focus on when we talk about replicating the DNA. Creating what you enjoy here, as Jeff referred to earlier, when he said people maybe want a smaller experience for the intimacy, but they want the services and all the resources that come with a 2,000 member church uh, and all the things that that can provide. And, th and that's wonderful, that's exactly what we're going for, but that DNA, that experience that you have in the children's area, in the youth areas, uh, in women's ministry, et cetera, across the board, is exactly what we aim to duplicate in these different areas. Um, but the other piece of the puzzle that, that I heard in that, and, and I hope you, you can draw the, or connect the dots back to what Brian talked about earlier in terms of his new role around leadership development. As we look to see how this develops, and as Jeff said, we, we bring up people through our organization, we help them grow the DNA or, or transform to the DNA of this church, that's going to be a part of what Brian's new role is, is to help bring up those leaders, help uh, bring them forward, and then prepare them for that ministry as it may translate through this vision. Does that make sense? Does that connect the dots for you? Yeah. 
In fact, yeah. one, of, one of the things that helped me a lot <clears throat> in my process over the last year was, you know, I kind of came to my decision and my trajectory before we hit last summer. I was well along the way, but we hit last summer and this new, new, new vision starts to bubble up. And I had kind of a little aha moment because we we, I was struggling to articulate what will my next five years look like? <laughs> that sounded good, you know. So it, it sounded interesting. It sounded valuable to your organization because I don't want to just hang around, you know. Um, and this aspect of leadership developments we're already building into our DNA right now through our staff and through our leadership institute, which is our internship program in the summer. That 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 started sort of galvanized for me because what God started to start tell me two years ago was it's time for you to give it away. It's time for you to hand it off. It's time for you to share it. And it made sense. It's time, maybe, maybe what I can do is prepare the next campus pastor. I can prepare the next, the next team to go off to do the next thing because of my years of experience um, here. And, and I'm not having to lead this staff because Jeff's going to be doing that. So it all, that, that, that was a little piece that to me felt, oh, there's a puzzle piece fitting and I didn't even know what was going to come when I felt led to, uh, in this direction. I think there was somebody back over here. Angie and Kelly. Kelly, Kelly and Angie. Angie, Angie Kelly. Hi, I was just curious with adding another campus, how you would address some of the student ministries that are building specific. Like, would you have to get from one site now to another site to another site if you have children in high school mm -hmm. or masterpiece ministries or yep. even the middle school is not offered at all the services. So I was just curious, yep. as a family, if you were to go to this new place, yep. would you have high school, middle school, mm. masterpiece and uh, things like Sterling? that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You know, that's a great question, and one of the things that we're learning is that um, some, of, some of our ministries, we would have to reproduce there. Some we would represent. Explain, so, explain, for example, for example midweek, midweek women's Bible studies. We wouldn't have to reproduce that every place. That already exists, and it's good. We would send them here. But for the worship experience on Sunday to be what we want it to be, we'd have to reproduce a lot of those things. Now, for, for student ministries specifically, because that was your question, the missions programs, the outreach events, the D groups, we won't have to reproduce all of that, but we would have to reproduce something on Sunday morning for those families that went with their, with their students. Uh, but we, we don't have all the answers for how exactly that would look, um, but that's what, how we're thinking now. Some of the things is we're doing and doing well and we could represent them and that'd be fun. Some things we would have to figure out how to rep reproduce that to be a healthy, thriving church there. That's a good question though. T typically, as we, we're, we're learning, is, is these new sites start off with sort of a uh, a very lean model in terms of staffing and what they do on weekends is, for example, it's worship, children's ministry on weekends, and, and that's it. It means, it means the students would typically go in with their parents to worship. Now, they would participate, and, and for example, Sunday evenings, they'd go to all their D groups and mix in with everybody else. All the campuses would be involved there. So some would be centralized, some would be local, uh, and we'd have to depend on where the site is, how large it is when it starts, to know what to put on that campus for weekends. Does that make sense? So. But it's a critical decision. Kelly Anderson has had yep. a hand up for a while right there. D, run. <laughs> <laughs> no, next one up. I'm, I'm short, so she probably didn't see me. Um, I, I just, this kind of tags on to the question that was um, just asked, but um, one of the things that is really exciting to me, hearing about this for the first time, is uh, the aspect of starting a church from scratch with the idea of knowing that you've got many special needs families, um, either with children or even adults, uh, who from the get-go might be potentially um, in mind as we're designing and helping to build those churches. Um, so would Masterpiece in particular be something that we would try to uh, provide for in each one of these sites? That's a great, uh, Masterpiece has quickly become a part of who we are. And so yes, I think we would want to be special needs sensitive uh, and strategic about that at any of our sites. Buddy Break and other things, again, we might represent those there. Uh, but yes, I think, I think that's become part of our DNA, part of what we want to reproduce and who we are. And part of the reason people come so, from so far away to the church, and so we'd want to do that in other places as well. That's, but I'm glad you asked that. Uh, the question that I have is uh, whenever there's a merger of two different cultures that uh, somebody has to yield in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> now, in the, the case of 
and your discussions with multi-sites and mergers, uh, how has this uh, issue been addressed? That is, the, the church that approached you has obviously got a, a reason for merging. They just didn't want to do it because they wanted to merge and, and share our name. So that there are going to be people there that are not going to agree with us in way, shape, or form. Uh, they've got uh, people that have left for whatever reason, leaving behind. Uh, the whole issue of their leadership may or may not be compatible with ours. So how do you integrate successfully something into our culture? Great. Oh, yeah, some great questions. You, guys, you should be on our, our, all of our, you're asking exactly the right questions. Merger is a bit of a misleading term in this situation, Tom. Because the truth is, in, the, in a situation like this, it's probably more of a death and resurrection where that entity ceases to be and it's reborn as something new. It's not a strict merger. Having said that, I think we would want to do everything we could to welcome the people that are attending there, if, if they were to come, or any church that we were to take over, welcome them, celebrate them, make them part of our church family. In this case, it might involve a shutdown period where we would make some investments in that facility. And there'd be a period of time where there was nothing going on there. And then it'd be re reopened as you know, uh, a, new, a new entity. So uh, you're right about the merger thing. It's not, we're not talking about, hey, you come on our board now and you all come on our staff now. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an acquisition, as it were, and a launching of something new. Yeah, there, and that's, it's cru crucial. Part of, part, of the, um, part of the dance or part of the negotiation process and part of the discussion all the time leading up to where, where you, you absorb another facility and their people is about that is about uh, are, are your people thinking of this as a merger or are they thinking about this as a death and resurrection? Are they surrendering completely? And that's the way it works best. What about Valley Brook? That's a church with our DNA, except for the, past, the senior pastor who came from Appleton, Wisconsin, but it was a Baptist church, so I assume that he has Baptist DNA in him. And how did, how did the thinking about Valley Brook go in uh, compared with, uh, as, as uh, compared with a new church. Yeah. Great. We're having the DNA tested right now to see if he has it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great question. You know, some of you have been around long enough to remember that, but it was about a decade ago, about 10 years ago or so, maybe a little longer now. We did plant what we call a daughter church. About 100 of our people went out. We, we found a, uh, a plant pastor. He came in with us. He was only with us for a few months. And there are several things about that model that we would like not to reproduce for various reasons. One is um, he came from the outside in, and uh, I mean, I, I, I know Brian and we see each other and stuff, but he never really had any of our DNA. He wasn't here long enough to pick up any of it, to whatever, whether that's important or not. He was never here on our staff. He was here just long enough to gather people and he went. That was the model we followed. He, they became as ind independent as fast as possible. And um, so that church, I have no idea whether they have any of our DNA or not. I suspect very little of it because um, most of the people from here who went out came back over time. Still, there's still there are some out there. And that model, we, would, we are not trying to reproduce that. It was what it was, and, and that church is still in existence. We, this time, want to do one where it's, it's, uh, we make a more intentional effort not to cut the ties and let them go independent. This is that's exactly the opposite of that. Uh, this is going to be like... like you know, we have, right now we have six services every weekend in one, two, three different... Four venues. Well, four venues counting Saturday night, and every one of them is part of us. You may only go to one of them, but there's three others. You know they're out there. Worship Cafe, Saturday night, and all that. This would be like just another one of those. Uh, with us, our pastors, our preaching, our preaching uh, themes, our series, our worship people, our children's ministry, the same colors and all that, it would just be a different room that they're in. That's the way we're thinking about it now rather than an independent church plant. For all the reasons he said, independent church plants fail way more often than multi-site campuses fail. Multi-site campuses have a much better success rate because they're underneath the central government and leadership of, of one church. Uh, so you, you kind of touched on this and maybe it changed my question a little bit. Is the plan for the two of you to preach at all three um, campuses? 
or will you select one and there will be different preachers at either the east or west and the third campus or, or what's the plan another for great that? question yes you guys are, I, what i love about these questions is how how smart you all are you're thinking way ahead yeah. it took us like six months to ask all these questions you're doing it in like one hour um uh, go ahead. we don't know the full answer to that right now i do know this we don't want to plant a pure video venue uh, having said that, I think we need to have the capacity, should we need to, to do a video sermon at all of our campuses uh, on certain occasions. Uh, but we want predominantly live preaching. It's probably going to be a third preaching pastor and a fourth. And so we would, and so yes, Brian and I will continue to be preaching as well as Pastor Sterling and perhaps people we don't yet know about. Um, but I, I see that as a good thing. For the, I mean, I'm where I am because Brian didn't hold all that and say, no, I got to do it all. I think there's a, I'm not, I know you weren't saying, implying this, but I'm just going off on a different trail now. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> I, I think that it's, there's a lot of hubris involved if you think, well, one guy has to do all the preaching. There are lots of gifted people in God's kingdom and, and the churches to raise those people up and identify them and, and set them loose. So, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here if Brian had said, well, no, let's just do video. I can do it all. Um, and I think there are other people that would, we would want to be excited to do the same thing with down the road. So, so right. I, we, there would be a, 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 I think our assumption would be, with our third site, there would be a designated campus pastor who would be their pa that pastor. He would preach there most of the time, but we would yes. be free to rotate uh, as we saw needed to make sure people felt and knew all of us. But there would be a main campus pastor that they went to, that was their go-to guy. Yeah. I want to be careful I don't say more than we've thought our yeah. way through yet. Yeah, and I was just about question. to do that. Um, this is the second meeting of yeah, four, yeah. and these are fantastic questions, uh, and we want you to keep them coming. Uh, we want to use the next two meetings to really start to uh, articulate some of the details, some of the refinement, uh, some of even the course correction around this vision, this thought. And hopefully uh, by the four, fourth meeting, we'll uh, culminate with some, some uh, basically some action steps. What, what's next? What do we need to do? Uh, how do we need to involve you? And certainly, uh, what do we need to put forth to the membership in terms of an actual vote to give us the authority to move forward at certain levels? So those are, those are conversations to come. Um, but what needs to frame those conversations is your continued questions. So uh, we would very much appreciate, need, ask, beg you to continue to the conversation, uh, to send your questions to Brian, to Jeff, uh, to myself, to anyone on the executive council, so that we can continue to hear from you and continue to make sure that we are addressing the issues, the great questions that you've brought forward, uh, adjusting our, our thinking where we need to just based on your feedback. That's the most critical process mm -hmm. that we have right now, is to get feedback from you, understand if this is resonating with you, understand if we're on the right course, and then course correcting as appropriate. Mm -hmm. So this is not just a feed you some information, this is a call to action to you to give us feedback, okay? Yeah. Very much desperately need that. And again, thank you for today's questions, they've been fantastic. We're nine minutes over. I hey, want to be very respectful of your before, time. Before you pray to close, can I? But before thing? I pray to close, I'd like Jeff <laughs> to just make. You know, uh, I said at the last meeting and invited you, and many of you have responded back to this via email or to me and to us, to, to invite you to pray with us. Because Ken's right, we need your feedback. We also need your prayers. We don't want to do anything God isn't leading us to do that isn't the right strategic move for the sake of the gospel and his kingdom and that we aren't aligned in. So I want to say again, we invite you to pray with us, pray for us, pray together for three things. For um, unity. It doesn't mean we all agree on everything, but we're unified in who Christ is and where he's guiding us. That we would not be divided over this. Second, for clarity. Increasing clarity on what God is showing us and where he's leading us. And then third, for the courage to follow that lead in the right timing. And I saw a post by Laura, my friend Laura over there, just this morning, where she said, praying for our church. She said those three things. And then she added a fourth thing, humility. So thank you for that, Laura. I think that's a good, good addition that in all these things, we stay humble and open to where God will, will lead us. So just wanted to throw that in there before you wrap us up. Perfect. Amen. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, let's ask uh, the Lord uh, to, or thank the Lord for this, this time together. God, uh, as Jeff just said, um, it is so important to, to bring this back to you, to pray, to earnestly seek your will, your wisdom in all that we do. We thank you so much for this, your church, uh, we thank you for the opportunity to serve in it. And now, Lord, we just ask that you continue to guide us, that you give us wisdom and give us the clarity, give us the humility, 
um, give us the courage that we need to step forward as you would have us do. Thank you so much for this time together. Please bless everyone here and bless us throughout this next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.